A Very Old Man with Enormous Wings has to be one of my favorite short stories. Um, I don't know if it will be one of your favorite short stories or not, uh, but what I hope to do in this lecture is talk a little bit about how we might approach the story, okay? And I think we might find many answers to any number of questions that we might have about this story by simply paying attention to the opening and remembering some of our basic terms. Okay, so a very old man with enormous wings, a tale for children. Well, that should ring some bells, right? So let's take the first part, a tale. As we've discussed before, we can think of a tale as a story that is bound to raise more questions than provide answers. We will probably have more questions at the end of the story than we have answers, or the end of the story itself will simply raise some questions and things will seem unresolved. We know that. That's been indicated even before we get into it, right? But it's not just any kind of tale. It's a tale for children. So what does that mean? What should we expect? What does this story tell us about children? I think that's one of the really important things to keep in the back of our mind as we head into it. Everything that we encounter, we have been, it has been indicated anyway, would be uh, something that would be appropriate for children in the sense that it would function as a tale for children. So it would, it would get the interest of children and then would leave them with questions. As we begin to dig into the story, we might think about a couple of our fundamental concepts from the class. One is that here we have uh, an author, Gabriel Garcia Marquez. We've read Russian authors before. We've read writers from different parts of the continental United States before. We've read people from various ethnic and religious backgrounds and racial backgrounds in this class. Here we have our first um, uh, author associated with the Latin American literature. Okay, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, and just would be, as would be a safe assumption, um, really for anyone that we've read, if we haven't read much before, but certainly in the context of this class, here we recognize we have a voice speaking to us from perhaps, for some of us, a spot that is beyond our normal cultural horizon. So we should expect it to probably sound distinct from the voices that we hear every day. But, as well, going along with the theme of this class, what we should expect is that this voice will be communicating things to us that at least on a fundamental level we can associate with our own understanding of the world and through that connection expand our view of the world as we recognize there are shared anxieties and aspirations in other parts of the world, be it geographic, be it cultural, be it temporal, by which I mean different points in time. So we have the story from Gabriel Garcia Marquez. We know it's a tale for children. We know that it is published in 1968. These are some fundamental facts. And if you think I'm belaboring the facts too much, hold on. Because once we get into the story, things are going to get weird really quick. So as you notice very early on, um, there are a number of incidents in this story, a number of descriptions that don't seem to have any corresponding reality with the world that you or I may know of. So let's just go back a little bit. On the third day of rain, they had killed so many crabs inside the house that Paleo had to cross his drenched courtyard and throw them into the sea because the newborn child had a temperature all night and they had thought it was due to the stench. Okay, so a couple of things to notice right away. Even before we get into the details of the story, what kind of narrator are we dealing with here? Appears to be a third person narrator appears to be a third-person narrator with at least at this point limited omniscience. How do we know that? Because he seems to be able to get into the head of Paleo. Okay, and you'll see multiple other moments in, this, in the tale uh, where it appears he gets into other, she gets into other people's heads. So what is this voice? What are some of the qualities of this voice? You might want to write that down because if we keep that in mind, the story becomes a lot less confusing. The world had been sad since Tuesday. Okay. Does that mean it's been raining? Sea and sky were a single ash gray thing, and the sands of the beach, which on March nights glimmered like powdered light, had become a stew of mud and rotten selfish. The light was so weak at noon that when Pelea was coming back to the house after throwing away the crabs, it was hard for him to see 
what it was that was moving and groaning in the rear of the courtyard. He had to go very close to see that it was an old man, a very old man, lying face down in the mud. Now, to this point, there's nothing about this story, necessarily, that would place it beyond the bounds of anything that we've read so far. The narrator might sound a little bit like the narrator of The Swimmer, for example, but pretty much straight, fairly realistic, artistic description you can imagine being grainy. You can imagine what it would be like in a coastal community that was inundated with water. You can imagine what it would be like to have a child who was bothered by the stench of dead crabs. And then we get this, lying face down in the mud, who, in spite of his tremendous efforts, couldn't get up, impeded by his enormous wings. Okay, and this is going to be a fundamental gesture, a fundamental phrase, a kind of phrase that is going to repeat throughout this story. Throughout this short story, you will be continually presented with images of things that probably don't exist in the world that you know, right? Um, and as you get into this, uh, as we go down a little bit further, he's gotten his wife, Alessandra. They go to see the old man about a little more than halfway down the second paragraph. Then they dared speak to him, and he answered in an incomprehensible dialect with a strong sailor's voice. That was how they skipped over the inconvenience of the wings and quite intelligently concluded that he was a lonely castaway from some foreign ship wrecked by the storm. Now, okay, I've been presented with something not of this world, and then the people viewing it don't seem to come to a conclusion about it that I would come to about it. So, for example, if I see a man with enormous wings and he speaks to me in some incomprehensible language, my first thought is probably not going to be, oh, he's a shipwreck survivor. I mean, maybe, but it, that wouldn't be, you know, probably the first thing I would, I would conclude. Um, or you might, I don't know. But regardless of whether or not we would conclude that, we probably wouldn't conclude what happens next. And yet they called in a neighbor woman who knew everything about life and death to see him. Would you reference anybody in your life as someone who knew everything about life and death? Probably not. What would it mean to live in a world where you just, oh yeah, there's a lady down the street. She knows everything. Uh, we'll get her. And what does she say? And all she needed was one look to show them their mistake. He's an angel, she told them. He must have been coming for the child, but the poor fellow is so old that the rain knocked him down. Notice a couple of things. Notice that at least two of the weird events that have already happened have been associated with the child. So the, the child's sickness was associated with the, with the dead crabs that were invading. And now this woman, who apparently knows everything about life and death, and it's, I think that's an open question, is saying this is an angel who is coming for the baby, but he was knocked down by the rain. All seems to make perfect sense, right? Well, except it doesn't make any sense at all if we have a realistic expectation for the story. And what we need to understand at this point in the class is that fiction is very rarely about the real world, even when it appears to be. And that's going to lead me into a few comments, some comments here that will last a couple of minutes. So I want to remind you of something that's maybe all too obvious when we read fiction that we often overlook. So if we go back to our table of contents page, okay, and we think about stories like everyday use, we think about stories like what you pawn I will redeem, we think about stories like Sonny's Blues and Cathedral. One of the things that we might forget when we're reading these stories is that they're all fiction which means that they're all describing events that didn't happen, but it's also important to understand that they're describing events that probably are very unlikely at best. When we get to everyday use, let's just think about everyday use for a second. Nothing could seem perhaps more realistic than that. An upset mother, a, 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 a estranged daughter, um, and a conflict over family heirlooms. 
all families have these fights. Oh yeah, that's true, except they don't have them in this exact way. It's very rarely the case that all of these dramatic things would come together at once, right? That you get all of these things expressed in one particular interaction. Most families who fight about heirlooms do that over multiple conversations, over a long period of time. It's not one very dramatic instant. Fiction lets us represent it in one very dramatic instant so that we can connect with it. If I think about what you pawn, I will redeem. Here we have a homeless man who wants to get his grandmother's regalia. Okay, I'll buy it. But then I notice that he's outrageously successful throughout the story, getting significant number, a significant amount of money for seemingly random acts, right? He keeps getting money, he keeps getting money, he keeps giving money, he keeps getting into these dramatic situations, passes out, wakes up, meets more people who give him money. The number of things that happens to him, in terms of the success with which he acquires money and gives it away, is not believable. But we buy into the fiction. We, what's called, we suspend our disbelief. Okay? We suspend our disbelief. To borrow a phrase from Coleridge, I believe, Samuel Coleridge, great English poet. When we read a short story, read any kind of story, we suspend our disbelief. We know things don't actually happen this way, but we, will, but we buy into the premise of the story. Cathedral, right? It just so happens that this jerk um, has the opportunity to have a profound connection with the blind man, Robert, uh, during that man's visit that evening, right? Well, if that's how the world worked, then people with bad attitudes could be fixed really, fixed really quickly. But it's really very rarely the case that people with bad attitudes have the opportunity to fix their bad attitudes when it would be most beneficial to them. That's why they still have bad attitudes. But we have this fantasy that he's a bad attitude, the guy shows up, they reach an important moment together. Story of an hour, incredibly dramatic, right? It just so happens that she's told he's dead. It just so happens he happens to be on a different train. It just so happens that he comes back at the worst possible moment for her. We buy into this story. But what we need to understand is that there's absolutely nothing realistic about those stories. That's not how events tend to transpire in everyday life, right? So one of the things we do with, with realistic stories, and I put realistic stories in big air quotes, is that we tend to overlook the fact that even when the people, places, and things that are being described are you know, conform to the rules of reality as we understand them, no magic, the very sequence of events is fantastic, by which I mean imaginary by which I mean it doesn't relate to the actual world in terms of being replicated in your day-to-day -day life. Now, but that does not mean that it's useless any more than it would mean that it would be useless that if I can demonstrate a mathematical theorem, that that mathematical theorem isn't relevant to the universe. right? Or if I can, I can demonstrate a scientific experiment to prove something to you, even if that exact experiment doesn't actually occur by itself in the universe. For example, the Large Hadron Collider. Um, in Europe, uh, uh, smashing subatomic sub -atomic particles together at the speed of light, right? It's not like there's big, you know, colliders like that out in the universe doing the exact same thing. But we perform the experiment so we can understand the broader world. We make the artificial thing so we can understand the broader world that we live in. Fiction does the same thing. I'm a mad dog biting myself for sympathy. A lot of coincidental things here, right? Steals the toucan, steals the car, has the baby, abandoned the baby, the baby doesn't die. All these things line up just perfectly for our narrator to come to his closing statement. It's very rarely the case that all those kinds of things work out perfectly in life. A rose for Emily. Everything seems very reasonable until we get to the end and we realize our understanding of what was happening was absolutely wrong. So, let's return now to a very old man with enormous wings. When we get into this story, this tale for children, explicitly defined as such, one of the things that we're going to see throughout the entire story is that very little of what's described probably corresponds with reality as you understand it. Father Gonzaga's interactions with the angel 
is my favorite paragraph on 146. The curious came from far away. A traveling carnival arrived with a flying acrobat who buzzed over the crowd several times, but no one paid any attention to him because his wings were not those of an angel, but rather those of a sidereal bat. So there's other winged people in this world. The most unfortunate individuals on earth came in search of health. A poor woman who since childhood had been counting her heartbeats and had run out of numbers. A Portuguese man who couldn't sleep because the noise of the stars disturbed him. A sleepwalker who got up at night to undo the things he had done while awake. And many others with less serious helmets. Um, yeah, so all these individuals who are showing up all have some quality or characteristic that when you hear it, you immediately say, that's not real. One of the things that the fiction is doing is it's enjoying the fact that it's fiction. And, and we can enjoy the fact that it's fiction. It doesn't matter that these things aren't real, right? That, that shouldn't make you mad. If it makes you mad, then I'm sorry. You got to suspend your disbelief and engage the, the fiction. So, but we understand it's a tale and we understand it's for, for children. So we might ask ourselves, okay, so what are the kind of questions that this story raises, right? And, and even, let's just take it from a very naive kind of very childish perspective for a second. And we'll say something like, you know, is this possible? Are there old men with enormous wings? Are there women who've been transformed into giant spiders? Is there a noise from the stars that could bother you as you're trying to get to sleep at night? Um, are there acrobats who have bat wings? It, it, these are all questions of, of wonder. And then we, what we might also start to recognize is that isn't it kind of nice that there are in the story all of these things? What a fantastical, imaginative world, and this is the kicker, that very deliberately, very obviously, and without any kind of artifice, allows us to imagine beyond the world that we live in every day with kind of absolute freedom, right? So there's no sense here that we're, that, we're, that we're seeing a place that just is a few miles from where we live. The world that's being represented here is completely magical, it's completely artificial with respect to the world that we all live in. And so one of the reasons I like this story so much is that it's such an unapologetic kind of call for and endorsement of fiction. It's pleasant, it's entertaining, it's awe-inspiring to just allow yourself to imagine and to not have to be held down by a sense that things are only worth learning about if they're, if they're realistic, if they're described in ways that already conform with how I know the world to be, right? So if I'm only interested in reading things that affirm what I already know, then why read it all, right? Marquez kind of throws us, gives us the opportunity to kind of throw our imagination out as far as we want and also to think about, you know, how strange, how strange that, 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 that action can be. I really like the end of this story. The last paragraph where um, Alessandra's um, cutting the onions at the kitchen window. And she looks out and she sees the old man flying away. Alessandra let out a sigh of relief for herself and for him when she saw him pass over the last houses, holding himself up in some way with the risky flapping of a senile vulture. She kept watching him even when he was, she was, excuse me, through cutting the onions. And she kept on watching until it was no longer possible for her to see him because then he was no longer an annoyance in her life, which is a funny thing to think of the angel as being or the old man as being, but an imaginary dot on the horizon of the sea. Now I love that, and here's why I love that. Because he is imaginary, right? This is not a real person. It's an imaginary world with imaginary people doing imaginary things. And yet, in that world, we have a character. The last thing we see in this story is a woman enjoying her imagination. I think that's really important. He's left, and she can simply imagine him on the horizon instead of dealing with the reality of him. He's imaginary to begin with, but she's at, she she ends the story enjoying her imagination. So this you know this 
this tale for children raises all kinds of questions about the imagination, its use, whether or not, if and how, it might be superior to a realistic understanding of the world. And this is, I think, a direct call to the power of fiction. And one of the things is that it does is that it reminds us that fiction is always the imagination. It is not dependent upon reality for its ordering of events. There are stories that are more realistic than others in the sense that the people, places, and things more or less correspond to the world that we live in. Cars, planes, trains, people, money, romance, hatred, all of these basic things that we all experience. It wouldn't, wouldn't be valuable if we didn't do those things. But there, there's no reason why fiction needs to be only realistic. And it's not the case, and I think this is maybe one of the main points from the class, though we're not going to pursue it to its maybe logical outcome right now, but there's no reason why fiction has to be realistic to do all of the things that I've already said fiction can do this semester in terms of broadening your cultural horizon, getting you to think about the world in ways that are distinct from the ways in which you normally think about the world, and also in order to help connect us with the aspirations and anxieties of others. That can be done with a very realistic tale, like at home, or it can be done with a very imaginative story that makes really no pretense at realism, like a very old man with enormous wings. So I hope you enjoy it. Uh, there's a lot more in it than what I read, and there's some great descriptions along the way um, and those those deserve to be experienced kind of by you firsthand so I won't mention them here but I hope you have fun with the story.